So I did a live on Hassan Campbell a couple of days ago regarding the shooting that had happened to him in his old hood in the Bronx. Now, what are some things that we can really learn from Hassan Campbell's situation or mishaps? At least from understanding it from a combat sports lens, because obviously it's a combat sports channel with a little bit of some dynamics of geopolitics, maybe a little bit of some hip hop and some street uh, type of stories or whatever what you want to call it, right? Whatever type of category you want to solidify that as. Either way, the bottom line and the main theme is combat. Combat combat sports, combat in the streets, and combat in the world that is full of just worldwide conflict, right? So, a couple of things to really understand about that. Number one, you got to understand that sometimes you can look for danger or sometimes danger finds you. In this case, one of the things that we can really definitively say about Hassan Campbell is he went out and looked for trouble. Now, for those of you that are wondering why I'm wearing headphones right now, I'm actually watching his live that he's doing right now. And I decided, you know what? Why don't I just hop on in here, make a video about this while I'm reacting to his live. Now, the way that he describes it and the way that he goes about it is in absolute defiance of everything. But he also is very well aware and self-assured of his mistakes, which is very important to really highlight. Now, why is that? Oftentimes, there is a cognitive dissonance that goes on in our minds when it comes to the difference between the reality of doing a show and the reality of actually living a real life, meaning being yourself, being the everyday person that you normally are, the constant routines that you do, the uh, temperament and the baseline that you have as a personality and how you react and go about things. He was very forthcoming and not only that, very... Uh, very open with his vulnerabilities. And this is where the combat sports element comes into the story. Now, being self-aware and also being vulnerable in a sense of, let's say, Tom Aspinall. You take him, for example. The guy is one of the best heavyweights in the world right now, probably even number one to some arguments. But the bottom line is the guy doesn't come across as this hyper macho, I'm going to kill you type of guy, not by any stretch of anyone's imagination. He's a cool, calm, collected guy that understands his skill set and knows what he can do without having to really go out and play this undertaker role of being this big, bad heavyweight that everybody has to fear. He doesn't have to play that role. Whereas with Hassan Campbell's case, it seemed that we are dealing with a guy that, well, had a lot of unresolved issues. And, well, what are some qualities we can really try to uh, understand from that? A lot of combat athletes are people that are really broken and have a lot of unresolved issues. For those of you that don't know that, that is the reality of most of your favorite fighters that you see on a, on a weekly basis, on a Saturday, or maybe even a Tuesday fight, or maybe even a Thursday, or wherever. Wherever you see the fights, wherever you want to see your favorite fighter, a lot of these guys have trauma and unresolved issues. Sometimes, you can absolutely resolve them. In Hassan Campbell's case, he was able to, well, resolve some of his problems by moving out of the hood, taking himself out of danger, taking his family out of a destitute situation and into a life of affluent promise. Still, he goes out and yearns for danger. And why is that significant to try to understand? Most combat athletes still yearn for danger even when they have 
life-changing money. Because no matter what type of wealth you accumulate, there is nothing in the world that can absolutely match the feeling of being in front of people, especially if you love this, especially if you love the attention, the notoriety, not only that, the exciting moment of allowing yourself to fill your body with adrenaline knowing you are about to be in danger or perhaps maybe potentially putting someone in danger in this high stress situation. And sometimes there's the aspect of high optimal state of arousal where you are very much present in the moment of time that you are going to go into combat in front of the world and when it's game time and show time ready to go. It is one of the most addicting feelings in the world, no matter what level you do it at. Whether you've done it in the amateurs, whether you've done it in the pros, whether you've done it in the world stage, whether you've done it in a domestic stage or a regional stage, in any kind of stage, I swear to you, it is the most addicting thing in the world, and there is nothing in the world that can really, really give you that kind of fix. And you know who can vouch for that? Elon Musk and... Mark Zuckerberg. Now, obviously, we have yet to see these men fight. That's neither here or there. The bottom line is that these men put themselves in a situation where, you know what? I'm willing to go in there and prove that I can fight, and I'm not just this billionaire with all this money around me. And guess what? You think Hassan Campbell is any different from that? He's made it out of the hood. You know what? One of the greatest phrases that uh, Hassan Campbell said was that in the mid-2000s, the rappers would make fun of the YouTubers. Remember this, the mid-2000s, because when did YouTube came about? In 2005. And then all of a sudden, the music industry started changing from then on. And then it was 07, you had the likes of uh, Soldier Boy when he came out with the Travis Barker joint for the uh, Never Back Down uh, Mixed Martial Arts movie, which, by the way, featured Amber Heard. For those of you that don't know, a little fun fact. Just wanted to drop these fun facts in this video because this is what I do. Drop fun facts in the videos and uh, ask you guys to like and subscribe as I continue on with Hassan Campbell and how he can teach the combat sports world. For those of you that don't remember, there was a Brazilian guy who was a jiu-jitsu world-level black belt. Okay, got shot in Brazil in his head. And you could only imagine how this came about. Maybe it was just one of those situations where he was chilling, or maybe it was one of those ego-driven situations where the jiu-jitsu man said to himself, you know what, I'm one of the best guys in the world at doing this, there is no way this guy right here is going to disrespect me, and all it took was just a gun to take him out, just like Hassan Campbell. You know what he said in the live, and by the way, this is the reason why I have the headphones, is because I'm listening to him as I'm giving you guys a play-by-play -play and a bit of a mixed martial arts combat sports lesson uh, delved into this particular story. He said something to the effect of, you know what? I was probably just yearning for some hugs. I was probably yearning for just somebody to say, hey, Aki, what's up? What's going on? Really hurt inside. And then yet at the same time, he also doubles down and says something to the effect of, well, you know what? I'm going to go after these young boys and there's nothing they can do about it. I'm the man or this and that. Yet at the same time, the other cognitive dissonance with that, he goes into saying something to the effect of, well, I could have done it to these guys. I could have done it to that. And then he mentions something to the effect of uh, police involvement, um, evidence or this and that. Now make of that as you will. I could only imagine that a lot of people are going to give him a bit of some Colby Covington snitch uh, accusations coming his way. I can absolutely feel that just based on everything that he has said. But that's the information factor of uh, this message that I'm trying to relay with uh, what we uh, are getting updates on Hassan Campbell at this moment of time as I'm also trying to relate his story 
to a lot of combat sports athletes. I met a guy who was at a gym. I remember, I believe he was an employee for a 1FC. He, I believe, worked in one of the uh, American offices, probably some somewhere down in L.A., right? Uh, he said to me something to the effect of, you know what, I just really can't believe how a lot of these MMA fighters, and obviously he's been with, around a lot of them, so have I, so have uh, many people that I've uh, talked to on this page and the channel and uh, the networks of the people that I know in, in MMA. They've been around a lot of fighters, and what is the common thing that I had mentioned is that what? A lot of them are broken. And by the way, this is the same reason why a lot of them walk around with a chip on their shoulder. This is what that one FC employee told me. So I put that together and I said to myself, you know what? This is so true. I'm very surprised that there isn't enough MMA fighters getting themselves into situations where, where they get shot at. Now you look at Darren Till, obviously the guy was stabbed back in... Um, in Liverpool, England. I was going to say Sweden because I'm thinking of his uh, training partner, uh, Kamzat. But nonetheless, that's what we have going on, right? You have guys that have a certain amount of ego that they want to express in the streets. Which, by the way, one can argue is probably one of the most insignificant things that you can do as a prize fighter because your reputation remains intact in what you do in a cage and not so much in the streets. Or so you would think. However, for some guys, the code of the streets and their reputation in the streets still matter. Now, you can deduct that and say something to the effect of, well, you know what? That's immature. That's very uh, uncivilized of these men or this and that. Yes, but you also have to understand, perhaps you live with a different set of ethos and a different set of rules and a different set of uh, lifestyles that you're willing to uh, tolerate or not tolerate. With these guys, they are willing to tolerate a lot of chaos. They thrive for it. And sometimes you also have to understand that some of the most trauma-ridden people in the world yearn for these things because unfortunately it's the only thing that they know. Now, I'm not a medical or a psychological expert when it comes to understanding the breakdowns of this particular mental disease or this uh, mental mishaps of what people go through and the mistakes that perhaps they may uh, get involved in based on this trauma. But what I can tell you is that it is present in a lot of people to yearn for it, especially if it's one of the only things that they've known all their lives. At the same time, one of the things that you also have to consider whether fortunate or unfortunate, is that this creates real hard-driven athletes or one of the greatest artists in the world that can create art based on the pain that they've experienced and in ways that they can try to express it to the world, whether it's an art form or whether it's in terms of athleticism and expressing their bodily limits and whatever it is that they're able to uh, present to the world. By the way, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope I've given a good breakdown and an understanding of this matter that really on paper has no meaning in the world of mixed martial arts, but mixed martial arts and boxing to a lot of people is life. And this is the only reason why we do it is to try to relate everything that we know and understand through life. Don't forget to like and subscribe, watch till the end, and don't forget to tell a friend to tell a friend.